the bad five. <laughs> that should go on the blooper reel. And we're back. The Coverage Your Podcast. Uh, thinking of calling it the hot seat because uh, I'm ask, trying to ask the tough questions. My guest this week is uh, Rock Schindler. Rock is the founder and CEO of SD Refinery AI. SD Refinery is, uh, is refining data one word at a time. SD Refinery is using AI to mine unstructured text data found in all operations of an insurance carrier and turning that into, a, into usable information. Uh, you are a serious person for agreeing to be interviewed on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> hey, Rock, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing great, Nick. Thanks for having me. It's uh, a privilege to be here, and I'm uh, glad to take the time. Yeah. So uh, the, you're on the hot seat now. I'm going to start uh, peppering you with questions. Uh, Where did the name SD Refinery come from? Um, I'm assuming SD stands for sentence data. That's absolutely correct. And we, in fact, recognize the need to distinguish sentence data from other unstructured data, uh, well, t I think maybe we can get into that a little bit deeper in a if moment. If you want, if you want, let's uh, for the audience sake describe uh, structured and unstructured, and then and then uh, segue you back, segue your way back into SD Refinery. Sure. So, so what we found uh, in the industry is a lot of confusion around data, and what we recognize is that that people understand metadata, which is a name mm -hmm. and address that, that's simple to get your head around. And then the industry relies heavily on what we call semi-structured data. So a loss cost, a cause of injury. And those are codes that people assign based on reading information. And they assign a code and then systems use that code for reporting and for uh, different purposes. And what we recognize is that the industry really didn't have a good way to understand unstructured sentence data. And unstructured data has grown to include uh, video, uh, voice, and, and uh, picture, uh, along with sentences. And as you may know, there is probably, I think it's 80 to 90% of the data inside insurance companies, as well as other companies. In fact, when they make the projection of 80 to 90 percent they're talking about all industries and i think we all recognize that the insurance industry has more uh, written documentation and a lot more unstructured data than a lot of other industries so 80 to 90 percent could be low but the reality is again for us we recognize that calling it unstructured sentence data was a way to bring clarity to what we're actually talking about and so sd and in our title, SD Refinery does in fact represent sentence data. And then the refinery component relates to the fact that what we're doing is enriching information into something that's very valuable. We recognize unstructured sentence data is a treasure trove of knowledge about what's happening with your business and with your customers. And so the concept of a sentence data refinery is one that made a lot of sense, not only for the insurance industry, but for a lot of other industries as well. Yeah. I, I just can't go on to the next question without really trying to reemphasize or try to understand this. You're saying 80 to 90 percent, and maybe on the low side, of all the data that's in an insurance company is unstructured. That's absolutely right. And, and you'll find if you go uh, query this on, on our good friend, Dr. Google, you'll find there's a ton of data or analysis research that supports that number. Yeah. And it's growing at a, just an incredible rate. If you look at the insurance industry, even by the most conservative measurements, it's growing around billions of pages of unstructured data being added daily. And then you put that in, in motion and you think about the fact that as human beings, uh, the average person reads about 300 words a minute. You're a smart guy. You can probably do 400, but even with that, <laughs> even with that, okay, the, the fact I've been, in, I've been on the same book for like a week, so I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah, so the fact of the matter is that as, as human beings, we can't keep up with the amount of unstructured sentence data that's coming into the industry. Yeah, the, the ramifications, though, are massive because – you know, the, the promise of insure tech, when, you t when people talk about data, predictive models, AI, a lot of it, or most of the promise 
is around, you know, stuff you can do math with, right? So it's the structured data. And what you're saying is that all of that promise is just dealing, is just basically just beneath scratching the surface, just dealing with the top, you know, 10, maybe 20% of the data that's in the insurance company. And the rest is just almost ignored. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, and as I say it, oftentimes with people, if you understood risk perfectly, you could design the perfect system and know exactly what information to capture. But as we all know, and as we all experience that work in the industry, risk is imperfect. It's nebulous, it's abstract, and it's continually changing. And we don't know the risk that's happening today, nor do we know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. And the ability to look at the unstructured sentence data gives us an unprecedented ability to understand and react to risk in a way that we never could before. Yeah. Um, we're going to get into that a little bit more. I, I want to rewind a little bit back to the beginning. Uh, where'd the idea come from? Can you give us the backstory? Yeah, great question. So I started my career as an auditor with uh, Pete Marwick. It was Pete Marwick Mitchell back in the day, and now is uh, KPMG. And we were taking samples of records from a huge population. And we would take a small sample, 50, 100 records, you know, part of you know, 10,000 records, and we would read it. And then we would cast judgment on the population based on that sample. And I always hated that. I thought it was terribly inefficient. And then I got recruited to work in the reinsurance broking industry in 1994 after Walter Schutze, the head of the SEC, figured out that reinsurance was a lot more about banking than it was about risk transfer. And so there was a metamorphosis going on within the industry that made it much more of a quantitative calculated process of moving risk from the primary to the secondary market. And I got involved in that movement, but I saw the exact same thing. Reinsurers would come in to do an audit. They would take a sample of records and they would yeah. use that sample to uh, cast a judgment. And it was just horribly inefficient. I could give yeah. you a bunch of stories where you could argue that the process led them to an incorrect conclusion. And so in the early 2000s then, I was exposed to a technology that had been created by a group of five linguists from the University of Utah that had patented their technology to, uh, to look at what we call sentence data. And what they were doing, it's relatively easy to identify parts of speech. You can go out to the internet and get a part of speech tagger and it's simple, the nouns, the verbs, the prepositions. What they had patented was their ability to identify nouns that were the initiators of action versus the recipient of an action. And that really becomes critical, critical excuse me, because people write in a lot of different ways. But the first time I saw that, I realized it could be a game changer for the insurance industry because you could apply it to an entire population and you could start doing some things that you otherwise couldn't do. And that for me was the start of the journey then. And I've uh, I've spent 14 years on this and I'm working now with uh, uh, SD Refinery as my third uh, entity, uh, the third version. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the one that's got it all right. <laughs> it's put together all the pieces in the right way. And, and that's exactly what we're doing then now is uh, the, the, the essence of it is being able to look at an entire population of records and be able to measure things in a way that never could before. Okay. And I can drill down on that some more. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's where I was going with that. So uh, by all means, let's go ahead, talk about uh, the type of information you can glean from um, your technology. Well, that's by far the most challenging thing that the industry faces. And I want to take one step back, though, if I could, and, and challenge you a little bit, because if you think of where the industry is going, the insurance industry has figured out, uh, they have figured out that they don't want to hear about a new technology. They could care less about a new technology. They want to figure out what the new technology can do for them. And if you go back and look at the, the Zurich North America Innovation Championship, we were fortunate enough to be selected as a finalist, but they had 1,358 applicants for their championship, which is, I think, 300% more than what they had last year. It's a and lot the of reality technology. Is they're inundated, <laughs> yeah. inundated with yeah. technology, as is every other carrier. So guess what? They don't want to hear about a new technology because they could care less. What they want to know about is a use case in a way that they can make their business better. And what we've done more recently is, is really uh, 
uh, moved away from talking about technology, even away from talking about AI, because that does not matter. And you can talk about a lot of different lingo about AI, machine learning, natural language processing, deep learning, on and on and on. And guess what? It doesn't matter. What matters is what data are you starting with and what answers are you providing? And that's exactly where we're going now. If you look at the answers that we're providing, for example, uh, we will pull out the what we call uh, the events and activities. And Nick, when you, you held up a book earlier, you're reading that book, and any written documentation, you can think of it as events and activities. Uh, events happen, actions take place, events and activities. And so what we're doing is looking at any body of, of written information, identifying the critical operational events and activities. And once you do that, you set up an enormous amount of opportunity, for example, setting a milestone date for when an adjuster talked to a claimant, and then you can measure that across the entire population. But where I wanna go with this whole concept to your question that you asked here a couple of minutes ago, uh, what can we do with it? The right place to start, so anybody that is listening to this, okay, the right place to start is to ask yourself, what are the problems that you're facing today? And what are you doing to address those problems? And if you peel back the core operations of any insurance company, if I'm an underwriter, if I'm a, a, a adjuster, if I'm a, an executive managing that department, I have to rely on audits that I'm doing monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, a lot of people annually if they're lucky, which they will admit. Uh, I'm looking at three to five uh, files, part of maybe 150 to 250 that they might be managing, and I'm using that audit to cast a judgment on whether or not they're performing the things I've asked them to do. What we're doing is dramatically changing that, saying, okay, one of the criteria I'm looking for, go back to where I was a moment ago, is how quickly did the adjuster confirm uh, contact with a claimant? So now what we can do is we can measure that time, we can establish an average for the population, and we can establish the highs, the lows, and if I'm gonna go look at uh, files to audit, well, guess what? I'm gonna go look at the, all the people that are sucking, all the people that have are taking way too long to contact a claimant and figure out what's going on. So we're clearly bringing information back in a quantitative way. It all starts though with being able to identify those events and activities going on with an insured, uh, with a claim file, with an adjuster. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Explain the difference between, um, I think you have, but let's go a little bit further for those in the audience that, uh, that are listening that may not still understand what exactly is happening here. How is it different than uh, traditional character recognition software that's you know, taking unstructured uh, files, for instance, and just saying, well, here's a, we just read it and we just put it into a digital format. Yeah. Can you give us an example of the additional enrichment that occurs um, through through your process? Yeah, great question. And I have to acknowledge, okay, I have worked in the industry for 34 years, and what I'm about to tell you, I was oblivious to it until I was on the phone with a carrier here a couple of weeks ago, and they shared this with me. And that specifically, uh, when the industry talks about OCR, what they're talking about is being able to pull information off of a document. Uh, so a scanned image or something to, to that effect, a PDF, a scanned image. What they're doing is pulling the characters off of the document and pulling it into a system. And the, the right analogy okay, relates to, in my mind, uh, it, it all relates to food. Okay, OCR is food preparation what we're doing is food consumption. <laughs> and I wanna, you know, we, we can build on that a little bit, but to go back to what I just learned here a couple of weeks ago, this carrier has about 8,000 people uh, and they have uh, anywhere from 10 to 15% of their people. So anywhere from 800, 1200 people that are dedicated to dealing with incoming documents trying to figure out what is in the documents, where is it supposed to go, how do we label it, and how do we make sure it gets to the right place. That's just mind boggling to me that carriers are having to spend that amount of time and energy around 
making sure the incoming information is consumable and getting to the right place. Because coming in on a document, and we've done a number of, uh, of uh, projects like this, and, and what we're doing is pulling off information uh, from the document. So a first step has to be to, to get the characters into, uh, into a, a table. And that can be thought of the, as the OCR, the optical character recognition process. But think of it this way, Nick, if you, uh, if you spent all your time preparing food and never eating it, you would die of hunger, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's the food preparation that's the equivalent of the, the OCR where it, needs to be, where it needs to occur. But then the second process, what we're doing is saying, okay, what, what is the written information telling you? And for example, what we've been doing is pulling up when a claimant pulling information off a medical record, talking about when a, cl a claimant has a confirmed comorbidity or is being treated for a comorbidity, being treated for diabetes, being treated for, uh, uh, for anxiety or depression versus when a claimant has been uh, tested but has been proven uh, negative, or there isn't, uh, there isn't that condition. Or another yeah. one is surgery saying, uh, when has a claimant had a surgery or when is a claimant being scheduled for a surgery? And that's what we're doing with our technology. The key thing that we're doing is distinguishing the context, it happened, did not happen, or may happen. And so when we pull out those critical events and activities, distinguishing, okay, the surgery may happen, so it's a future event versus it's a past event, and that uh, has significant implications to what a uh, what a an adjuster is or is not going to do. For example, with case management or follow up or with reserves, all sorts of uh, implications for how they are adjudicating the claim. Yeah, as as you're talking about that, I'm thinking it uh, it reminds me of uh, filtering and sorting structured data. But filtering and sorted structure data in Excel where, you know, uh, in a complex workflow, there are a lot of decisions that need to be made. And a lot of times you spend uh, an, an enormous amount of effort just saying, well, uh, the, the workload's big. How can we filter and sort this so that, for example, letters, uh, uh, correspondence that comes in via fax or via, uh, uh, you know, USPS, right? Uh, can we immediately split this out into this is claims and this is this goes to underwriting and then the ones that go to underwriting can we read it and can you know uh, or, or the ones that go to claims this one is a death benefit this one is a PD this one uh, this one goes to the auto uh, there's probably a tremendous amount of effort as you're as you were talking about all of the the work and the employee count that's required to do that. I bet a lot of it is just sorting and filtering and just getting it finally down to the expert who's going to adjudicate the, the, the final piece of it. And your, your technology sounds like a lot, a lot of uh, in, those, in those decision nodes, filtering and sorting. Like, hey, let us just quickly read it and we'll tell you, like it, it, we, can, we can funnel these things off quickly so you don't have to have such massive staff just to do, just to read documents. Yeah, so that's absolutely true. And so I guess to stay with our food analogy, it's a Saturday, we can get away with it. So, yes. uh, so that might be uh, you know, whipping up some guacamole because that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty quick, efficient thing that we can do. Uh, but to go back to those applications on the incoming documents, oftentimes what these carriers are running into is they don't know whether it's original content or duplicate. And we've had a couple of situations where we were doing pilot contract work for carriers where they sent us documents and we went through and pulled out all the duplicates and they came back with a, a red face and said, well, we didn't even realize they were duplicates. Can you do that for us on a regular basis? Which of course we can. Yeah. Again, so it's, it's like the, the, when you, if, if anyone has gone through a carrier, I bet as you sit in these individual silo departments, how much work is duplicative? You know, how much work is just, there's no good process to handle it. So that's, that's, Rock, that's probably occurring in like every department in an insurance carrier. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. 
and it's a it speaks to the inefficiency of the industry and i think that's what is as long as i have worked in the industry i've seen the industry really get frustrated uh with its inability to have the right information in the right place and time and i can go back uh to the 34 years and probably count on one hand the number of companies that i encountered that felt really good about their system that said okay we've got exactly what we need to make the right decisions. It just doesn't happen. And the reason is mm -hmm. because back office systems were never designed to capture and understand the judgment that people are applying to an underwriting file or to a yeah. claim file. And yeah. all their judgment is, is captured in their sentence data. All the documentation that they're creating gives us the perfect window into what they're doing, when they're doing it. And that tells us if they're applying good judgment or bad judgment. And ultimately, as you know, Nick, because you've been in the industry a long time, good judgment produces bad results. Excuse me, good judgment produces good results, bad judgment, bad results. And so the quicker we can figure out who's applying the right judgment at the right time, the better we're able to uh, put those people in the right spots, but then also, go back to the people that are making poor judgment at the wrong time and we can apply the corrective action to them. Yeah. That's, I, and, I, and that, I want to add, that, go ahead. I, I want to add to that because it, 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 it's still, it's still bewildering to me that potentially 80 to 90% of all the data in an insurance company is being ignored. So uh, I would add to from poor judgment to in good judgment to no judgment, yeah. which has all sorts of ramifications, right? If you, uh, 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 this is the second time this week, I'm going to throw this uh, lyric out, uh, the rush lyrics. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Right. And it's by having all this data sitting there, not doing anything with it. It, uh, most more, I would think more likely than not, that's going to end up in the poor judgment case, the poor judgment side of the ledger, where bad things are going to end up happening because you didn't do anything with that data that was just sitting there. It just, it's still bewildering to me that all of that data is there and we're focusing on the 10 or 20% to manage a trillion dollar industry. I completely agree with you. And we would, we would kind of respectfully submit that it's almost like you have a, a analysis fatigue on the yeah. structure data, the semi-structured data is there. And we've got all these great tools to analyze data. So we analyze the same data over and over. And guess what? There's a lot of great things coming out of the, the new analysis tools. But the fact of the matter is by ignoring 80 to 90% of your data, you're still going to end up in the wrong place a lot of times mm -hmm. unintentionally. Yeah. And you, you could argue, Nick, that it's not being ignored. Uh, because the, you're you're tapping into it when you do a file audit, okay? So you're 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 touching a sliver of it. But here yeah. here's a good analogy for you because I started when I started business uh, back with uh, Pete Marwick. It was just when the personal computers were coming into being, and we used to use ten key calculators to add, subtract, multiply, divide. Over a ten year period of time, when the personal computer was introduced, shortly thereafter, the uh, the electronic spreadsheet Lotus One Two Three BusyCalc was introduced, and over a ten year period of time, the spreadsheets uh, came to transform the way the industry worked with numbers. Right, mm -hmm. it turned manual clerical processes into thought based problem solving activities because the spreadsheet was a platform from which you could do all these complex calculations. And so what I would say now is that any company that isn't using a tool like what we're offering is the equivalent of using a 10 key calculator to do a quantitative analysis rather than using the incredibly powerful platform to say, I can see the entire population in a way that I never could before. I can identify my critical events and activities and I can much more quickly figure out where good judgment is happening and where poor judgment is happening. Yep. Okay, let's assume that someone's uh, listening to this rock, and um, we've we've uh, kind of hit a nerve with them, and they're they're completely uh, in agreement with us. Um, I I, I, mean, I want to try to have a segment of this going forward: buy versus build, right? I want you to explain to someone that's listening that's going to run back to their office on Monday, and uh, just and try to create an initiative to build something like this, why they shouldn't? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And what I would what I would submit, Nick, is that if you look at w where we're trying to go right now, we are trying to uh, give people uh, simplicity, and that's what we're trying to show executives. What I would say behind that simplicity is a tremendous amount of complexity. And for that, if you look at the number of people that are using uh, the the sort of approach and the technology that we are. There aren't very many people, if any. We are, in fact, we've a number of carriers have confirmed that we are exclusive in the way we're trying to tackle this problem. And the reason we're exclusive is because it's very complex. And that's the reason that it's, uh, yeah, I would kind of humbly submit it's taken uh, the number of years it has to get us yeah. refined to the point now where we can give uh, people something simple. In fact, I had a an actuary one time early in my career that. Uh, he was mentoring me with uh, problem solving. He said, Rock, you will encounter a lot of people in your career that are really smart. And the way to figure out the people that are really smart is the way is the ones that make it simple. And the ones that try to make it complex, you want to be careful with them because they're not nearly as smart as they think they are. And I think that's kind of where we are with, with this sort of uh, uh, technology. There's so much complexity behind dealing with language and the way people write, all the jargon, all the nuances that go with it. And if you go back to the kind of the 2005, 2006 timeframe, this is an interesting data point for you uh, because it's kind of when there was something called text analytics uh, came about. And you can still find people that would talk about text analytics. I never liked that term. I thought it was confusing. It's hard to say. It's hard to explain it. In the early days, I would spend my precious uh, 20 to 30 minutes with a prospect trying to explain text analytics, and you got nowhere. Uh, but in those early days, uh, people started focusing on what's called customer sentiment. And customer sentiment is really easy to figure out, respectfully. But even today, it's a, a billion dollar industry where companies are providing sentiment analysis. And uh, in those early days, though, there were some high profile uh, uh, RFPs that took place where the winner of that RFP was then selected to come in and negotiate uh, a service contract. And ultimately, they could not replicate the work that they did during the proof of concept. And that's a really critical uh, problem if you can't replicate your work. And one of the things that we've done with our platform is we built in 100% transparency. And we can always show people how you got from point A to point B. And so when you take on that process of building something, and I will tell you, I've encountered many people that have tried uh, and have failed miserably at doing this. Those are people that are some of my, my best contacts and uh, people that are continually looking for uh, opportunities to help us uh, bring solutions to them because they know they've tried it and they realize that they can't get to where they want to go. So yeah. to someone that wants to buy versus build, that's always going to be out there. But I, again, where I would go with it respectfully is that it's a, it's a dangerous place to go. We, we used to talk about it as being oceans of data. And unless you know where you're trying to go, if you get out on a, on a ship in that ocean, you can quickly get lost and uh, you lose your way. And I think that's yeah. exactly what the industry has learned. My guess is if I, if I have this as a repeated question on with all of my guests, I think the vast majority of time it will be, don't build it. Like it's more complex and more time consuming than you can possibly think it is. And, and like you said, it's uh, probably takes skill and art to make it look simple. But behind it, it's really complex. And, and, and that's part of the point of why I want to keep continuously asked this question is to make sure that uh, the you know, senior leaders at carriers uh, really think through, like, do I want a one or two year project? And, and uh, how, how expensive is that going to be for them to even learn the basics, like the stuff that you learned that's now old hat, the easy stuff they have to start from scratch and learn that right from the beginning. And uh, it's probably a lot more complex than they think it is. Yeah. So in the spirit of Jim Collins and good to great. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I would respectfully submit is that our hedgehog uh, is, is our ability to uh, contextually extract information 
and and apply that across a big population. Mm -hmm. And we can be the best in the world at, at doing that. And that's especially true in the insurance industry. And I've had a lot of uh, wrestling matches with my uh, with my mm -hmm. software architect and my my data analyst. Uh, and if you look at the ongoing struggle that we've had about on the back end, what how do we package our information? Because it's very easy for uh, people to spin up a really sexy looking dashboard and something that has really cool graphics. That's easier than it's ever been before. And for us, what we're doing is, is that really critical core work. And where I always went with, with my uh, software architect, data scientist, is that we cannot be the best in the world at creating dashboards and all those kind of sexy things we can in fact and we are in my i say that humbly um, i think the best in the world at being able to identify and extract critical operational events and activities from which you can do all sorts of things that you never yeah. could before and that creates a sea change in the way that management uh, can manage risk and insurance manage underwriters uh, risk services uh, uh, adjusters and most importantly their relationship with uh, with their insured customers yeah. and agents um, that's a, that's a good way to segue into the final question um, which is if should should we have interest anyone listening to this that this might be um, something that could help them in their business uh, what does an engagement with SD look like um, you know, does it require a big investment in hardware, software, organization? Talk about how you've been engaging. Yeah, it's a great question. So we are what we call a product as a service, meaning that uh, you know, we, we are a cloud-based platform. And the way we engage with clients is, is on a subscription. So, uh, so what we're looking for is that monthly subscription. And we would say it's relatively easy to engage. We don't require them to uh, implement any hardware or software. And I like to go back to the Excel spreadsheet analogy. Just like you download uh, quantitative information or numbers to put into a spreadsheet, we're talking about the same thing here. Yes, we are going to have to work with uh, the folks in IT to export or download the sentence data wherever it's stored, whether it's in documents, whether it's in a database table, wherever it is, yeah, we're going to download it. And that's the same thing that you would, that an executive would do if they were uh, pulling information out to do an analysis in Excel spreadsheet. So in that context, then we can provide information back in the way of a flash report or an event and activity scorecard uh, or something that's even a, a more detailed file that they might pull into uh, mm -hmm. an existing table to which they could expose their uh, AI tool, their predictive model tool, whatever they want. So for us, it's really, uh, if you think about it, Nick, it's a good way for us to, to talk about it. You know, we're not about the front end. We don't care where the sentence data originates. We can, we can come from multiple disparate sources. Okay. And likewise, we don't really care about where it's at on the back end. Because we, again, we can serve it up as a flash report, event and activity scorecard that can get served up as a, you know, through a, an email trigger, through a web browser. We're really about that, that core, and I haven't said this before uh, in, in our session here today, but it's cleaning, tagging, and extracting. That's really what it's about. Uh, and we're doing that in our environment. And I, <laughs> we don't want to get technical. What we want to do is give operational executives the ability to to get information that they care about and we're doing that kind of in that in that that middle piece not about the front end not about the back end we can accommodate whatever a client has there we're about executing in that middle that's where our secret sauce that's where a hedgehog exists yeah a uh, fantastic way to end it i've uh, i've learned a lot um which is part of why i want to do this you know i, I come um as, as we discussed before before we even started, um, part of the way I structure my questions is so I can try to understand more about this and, and I see it. And so now uh, I walk away with that 80 to 90% that's potentially not being used. Can you imagine um, some sort of crisis within the company where in that 80 or 90% is useful information that someone couldn't quite get to because it wasn't in a spreadsheet or wasn't in a database? So uh, let's do that. Um, thank you so much.
thank you for sp taking time out of your Saturday. Yeah, Nick, one more point. You mentioned sure. crisis. Okay, so go back to what happens when a crisis hits. If results get really bad, what do people do? They go back to the underwriting files. They go back to the claim files. They go back to the risk service report and they say, what the hell do we miss? What yeah. are we missing? Yeah. Why are we getting obliterated? <laughs> right. And let's, let's not miss it. Like yeah. going, yeah. going forward. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, com I, I completely get that. Yeah. But Nick, thank you for your interest in learning. I appreciate your appetite for learning and mm -hmm. I appreciate your interest in what we're doing. And uh, thank you for this opportunity yeah. to talk. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for sitting in the hot seat. Yeah, absolutely. My, it was I think, my pleasure. I, I think that's going to be the new name. There you go. <laughs> okay. Take okay. care. Thank you, yeah. Nick. Bye, everyone. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country.